recording. Okay, uh, so stream offline. Stream, yep, so we'll have to exit back out and then get back in. Welcome to those of you who are just now tuning in. Um, okay, we're back. To, to, the, to the new live stream, uh, let's speed run through introductions since the first part of our last live stream got cut, uh, cut off. I am guessing due to the anime that was playing in the background. Um, so uh, that's now off. Welcome to the Genius Brewing live stream. Uh, the news that we've got for us is Willet Beer is going to be happening today. We're shooting because Ryan's back in town. Woo. Uh, we've got a couple new beers that Warren's been brewing. So Warren's doing an awesome job and kind of taking over a lot of the brew duties here. And Thomas has uh, uh, got some news on where Emerus Fermentations is real quick. Yeah, Emerus is uh, still moving forward. We're getting everything figured out at the risk of seeming like an announcement about an announcement. Uh, I should have everything really well wrapped up the whole project ready to move forward here in a few weeks and i will be able to make those bigger announcements lead time opening hopes all that kind of stuff yeah so and i just posted the um uh, instagram, instagram on the chat and we'll also probably remember to post it onto the comments below if you're watching this yep. post uh post when we're actually live cool. we were in the middle of talking about what this topic's going to be about which is how we're going to make ipas better in 2023 uh we got a super chat from stefan stoudemire asking for us to freestyle our ipa and where we were at with that was i usually do between 10 and 15 percent flaked rye as my as my grain bill because i think that the pumpernickelianness the flaked rye is better than what you get off of malted rye and it's usually enough for some good flavor i use a small amount of acid malt just for brightness and the mash mm -hmm. ph because i don't yeah. use a lot of other coloring adjuncts mm -hmm. um uh and then uh that's i, I don't do too much with the uh, with the actual uh, malt bill other than that uh, water can i usually go kind of harder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so like high sulfates some calcium some bicarbonate stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, um, and then hops we can talk about what hops i don't i really recommend spicier hops because yeah. even though rye itself is not spicy people perceive it as spicy because of all the baked they associate like, the caraway uh, it's like rye doesn't taste like caraway but everybody has yeah. that association <laughs> yeah. yeah so i would i would definitely look at some of the hops that tend to be have that kind of spicy mm -hmm spicy or spiced characteristic to it nice to help to help and actually maybe throw in some of that caraway or some of those other mm -hmm. spite actual spices in to help build that perception um and with one of the things we were talking about is uh, you know as you mentioned caraway we were talking about how i think adding uh, you know, adjunct ingredients or other ingredients to IPAs might be a new wave that we see a lot more people trying because so far we're letting hops do way too much of the work in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned caraway. Can you think of anything else you might add to something like a rye IPA for? Oh man, yeah, rye IPA. I think there's a lot of a lot you can do with that. Obviously, there's a little caraway stuff you can do. Uh, kind of that piney juniper mm. um, uh, angle, uh, citrus, especially something like lemon or grapefruit goes with almost anything they're like the blue jeans in flavor <laughs> profiles they just go with anything yeah <laughs> I, I i didn't even think about those kind of citrusy flavors mm -hmm. but yeah that makes perfect sense to me especially if you end up on the thicker side with uh, the mash bill uh stefan's asking about mash from fermentation steps i just for my own process i pretty much always mash low um which would end up in a drier finished product and so the way i mash would be like 146 to 148 and then i ramp up to 165 to 170 mm -hmm. as a mash out over the course of like two hours um that's probably going to finish it you know even with the flaked rye somewhere between 1008 and 1010 which is pretty um thin but if you mashed higher like 152 154 or if you did you know other adjuncts you went with a higher adjunct load so that it was a thicker beer mm -hmm. uh, i think that's kind of where especially where some citrus would really help kind of cut through the extra body yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, and it, I think that's easier to do than trying to rely on, you know, all your technical steps to get all the right pinpoint flavors that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say it's. Flakes rye adds a lot of creaminess, just like yeah. uh, Adam Chumbly mentioned. Um, and then, well, and speaking of fermentation stuff, yeast, I, I would almost do one of the Kavike yeasts. Something that's going to go hot and fast. So Kavike yeah. actually will add some acidity, too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that'd be something where if I was adding citrus and using quiet, I'd probably wait until the end of fermentation mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. do the citrus part. Yeah. Um, just so that I can kind of do it to taste instead of, uh, you know, without knowing what all the quiet's going to do to the base beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, especially if you're doing something like zest, if you're adding lemon or grapefruit with some zest, I do like putting that in cold side mm -hmm. um, after fermentation. Maybe at the tail end of fermentation, I like to do a lot of additions while yeast is still going. I've always just been paranoid about uh, oxygen and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I do like to throw in a lot of adjuncts. Um, 
while there's still a little bit of activity, it's just a personal thing on there. Yeah. And I don't know if I hit too much on water chemistry, but I usually with rise, I think of them as like a grittier, more aggressive beers. Mm -hmm. So I usually go relatively high on sulfates, uh, calcium, bicarbonate, oh, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's probably a good reason to do softer profiles too, if you wanted to. But um, my thought is always kind of aggression on those. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that I was thinking, which I think can also double up as a flavoring adjunct for um, uh, for a rye IPA, that I think will also work as like a something you can add to a West Coast IPA is uh, hemp products. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Uh, do you have a lot of? Have you used hemp in some beer before? I know Black um, Label did at one point in time, but yeah, the ones the, locally. As far as that goes, I have used some seed. Um, I've used up some straight up flour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, I've done that a few times, and yeah, I mean. They do share a lot of characteristics with hops being in the same botanical family. Um, but yeah, I really like that flavor profile, whether we're talking about the seeds, that part of it, or or the flower. Yeah. I like that. And it does go, it lends really well to kind of a hoppy pale ale or IPA kind of thing. I am going to throw the caveat as I do whenever we speak about hemp. If you are professionally doing beers, double check because Your state laws. laws. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not talking about on the <laughs> profession. I was doing those at home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. I just we we have yeah. Emerus Fermentations is opening up with 100% <laughs> weed beers. <laughs> I was gonna say because we do mention Black Label and which Black Label's their hemp beer was really good. It was and, yeah, and it was I'm, an IPA. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad that we were able to try it before they got the slap on the wrist. Like they didn't yeah. get into too much trouble. It was more of a. Hey guys, this is a gray area that doesn't this fit in the yeah. law. This is let's not do this again yeah. because we don't want to get in trouble federal. It was yeah. more of we don't want the feds knocking yeah. on our door versus. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the the pungents from and they use seeds in theirs. Yeah, um, I don't know what do you know when they use it. They use it mash side or hot side or. I don't know. I, I think it was in the mash, but I, I don't want to be too confident. I feel like it was because I feel like it wasn't like how you normally add hops. I remember yeah. something to that effect. And yeah. I think yeah. there's a ways that the mash hops could not only add some of that, um, you know, that grit, that uh, that aggression, um, the dankness, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, as we're figuring out now with a lot of biotransformative properties, mash additions um, that add certain sulfur compounds can actually help mm -hmm. provide fruitiness too. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. making it rounder. Yep. Yeah. No, that would be. Riv, riv. Yeah, hey, I'm in the house. Say, yeah, we had that the, the same beer festival. Me and you were both at. Oh yeah, yeah with, with that hemp beer. Yeah. <laughs> it um, wasn't it, it, that. That was a different beer festival than the hopless IPA you gave me. That. <laughs> yeah. Why while you, I was pouring beer. <laughs> I'm gonna pour myself some beer. Uh, why don't you roll hop uh, into the end of the from the rye into the next thing, Thomas? Do you want something? Do you yeah. Want thing? Do you want one of your things or one of my things? Yeah, we can open up one of those cans if you want, or we can. Let's do that. Cool. Yeah. I was gonna say, I'm, even though I'm not drinking, I'm smelling. Nice, yeah. <laughs> I will. I will smell one of them. <laughs> Just um, uh, so, um, well, we uh, before we interrupt, we were kind of talking about West Coast, and I mentioned the first thing is not using the three big C's: Centennial, Citra, Citra and Columbus. Um, other things I like to see. Or mm -hmm. Cascade, sorry. It's not, it's, yeah. Any of the, oh, like, so just all, C's. yeah. There's all those, those are like 20 C's. Yeah. Comet, Calypso, Chanel. Donner, which, Blitzen. Which is actually hilarious <laughs> that we're bringing, uh, we're drinking a Northwest IPA. Yeah, yeah you uh, want to talk a little bit about this guy? It's more of a hazy. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's, uh, so another piece of Thomas news. Um, until I do get uh, Emrys fully f uh, running and everything, I am over brewing with uh, the Grain Shed. So here's a nice grain shed, uh, fourth edition uh, Inland Northwest IPA. Um, it's been really awesome. I started there just right after Thanksgiving. So I've been there like a month and a half or so. Um, this is the first can run that I was a part of them with, but really liking this one, how it turned out. Yeah. Um, the Grain Shed, by the way, for those of you who have watched the stream several times, you might have seen a couple of Grain Shed episodes before with Teddy um, and or Joel. And I uh, don't think we've ever had Joel. We may, uh, maybe really early on. We've had Joel in some episode before. Uh, anyways, uh, Grain Shed is a local uh, cooperative brewery thing that works with uh, their somewhat business associated with Link Malts. I think they're in the same co-op, but not the same business. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. Let's think that's um, the right structure. And Link Malts is our kind of our, our local, let's find some land race grains and find farmers to breed them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, they are a maltster, so we have access to crazy things like uh, red Russian wheat and uh, purple Egyptian barley, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to all the fun um, kind of more standard mainstays they have, like the, the lion's malt that's uh, 
um, tested slash uh, invented by WSU. Yeah, this is, that was a WSU mm-hmm. uh, breeding program. Oh. So not only is Thomas going to be our local botanical and tree <laughs> and weird things and honey expert, he's going <laughs> to add all the weird land race grains to his repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> and if this video gets 69 likes, I will try to get Link Malt on one of our live streams <laughs> soon. Yes, exactly 69 though. If you guys go over. Uh-oh. Then, then I'll try to get the whole Link Malt crew on. There we go. If it gets 696 <laughs> likes, I don't know. We'll, we'll just go do the live stream at Link Malt. <laughs> um, where are we go? Are we jumping into – do we have any questions we need to answer real quick before we jump into some West Coast? We were starting to talk about that a little bit before we the, uh, the stream cut off. No, no. Uh, well, I was going to say, I'm going to just call out Jimmy's dropping off his Alaska – his tree beer. beer. Mm. Our tree uh, beer is on tap. I guess we should have talked about that in the announcements. Yeah, uh, go watch that video. It's uh, hilarious. And <laughs> and I made a Christmas tree penis on the thumbnail. <laughs> he did. <laughs> um, it was. Yeah. Not? Uh, Jesse Zamak. Ah, I spent way too long trying to find info on Emerus last night or last week. Good to uh, know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, uh, send us your Arkansas because we haven't gone a single Arkansas beer. <laughs> nope. Um, and, I, I don't, uh, Alaska. I, I, I don't think we've done Alabama actually. Or uh, no, it's Alabama. No, uh, we're starting Ar- with we're starting Arkansas. with Alabama beers. So oh. Arkansas is the the third month. We're going alphabetical, but yeah, yeah. Uh, my Al- Alabama beer should be done pretty soon. So either way, we'll have something to taste in a you know upcoming video there. But I, I digress. Uh, are we jumping into yep. West Coast IPA? Yep. Uh, yes. Yeah, and so we mentioned just using different hops, which the uh, question was is have we used the Eclipse hops yet? And I have not. No, I haven't. I don't either. think I've used Eclipse. No. Um, do, so, you have a, do you have you find what you're looking at Adam's question? Is that you? What you're talking oh, yeah, to? I was seeing that about uh, uh, Triticale being brought up. Uh, kind of interesting. We're talking about IPAs and stuff. Uh, when I was still at Bellwether, uh, our – kind of main house it was a rotating different hops all the time ipa called fibber mcgee actually i'm not entirely certain if they're still making it but they are okay cool (laughs) that had about uh, a third of triticale um, malt in it yeah i assume it's still being made the same but that would be one example one local example of um, a little bit different adjunct if you're not familiar with triticale it's a hybrid of wheat and rye so it's got kind of properties of both um, but I really like that. I've used it in an IPA. I've used it in stouts. Um, I really like it. It does add a good protein, good mouthfeel. Mm. Um, and the, the flavor being kind of on that wheat side, to me at least the way I perceive it, is it's not quite as aggressive as rye, um, but it's a little more aggressive than wheat. Yeah. So. yeah. I was going to ask if you think sometimes rye can get too aggressive, which I would sometimes, say I fall into that camp. Yeah. I, think, I think it does. Mm-hmm. But if I'm making a rye IPA, I kind of I'm doing that on purpose. Like said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I like the flake stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I was gonna say, and that that leads into what I was gonna bring up for West Coast IPAs is also adjusting your grain bill. Adjusting the grain bills for slightly more yeah aggressive grains. Uh, if you use too many adjuncts, I think with West Coast IPAs, uh, and this is can maybe fall into one of the tips that I was gonna use for the hazies down the road. But if you use too many mm-hmm. adjuncts to adjust the flavors, you do have to do I think specific things to find the beer correctly. Uh, and in doing so, drop the uh, the protein low because a lot of West Coast RP- IPAs aren't really defined by being hazy for one, and then mm-hmm. also they're not uh, exceptionally thick. They can be, I think, on the upper end, like 10, 14, 10, 15, probably. Mm-hmm. But they're not, you know, they're not your forty percent adjunct thickness. Right. And so, yeah. Well, I was going to say I've done a with black label a West Coast coffee IPA before. Mm-hmm. That was actually really good. <laughs> um, so besides triticale. Um, would you throw anything else, uh, Thomas, into the into the mix of things that could roll into maybe on the sharp end of the IPA spectrum? Any of those kind of flavors that would come from malt? Um, if I'm really looking to kind of soften out or, or get kind of that pillowy, creamy quality to it, I do like adding some oats. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I've had some people like, no, that only goes in dark beers or whatever. But I, I do really like it sometimes in a yeah. in a nice IPA. Um, uh, spelt is another kind of a pre-modern wheat but it's it's in the it, it is a wheat but i really like spelt um kind of for that same thing adds that creaminess that that uh, bit of body um both of those what i just mentioned leave a good amount of haze if you're after a hazy ipa yeah uh would you say would you say that you could do a west coast so i i guess and this isn't really well defined honestly that even in the bjcp formats i feel like there's kind of a um a lapse in what can be uh, ipas in general aren't going to aren't designed for the most part to be crystal clear with maybe one or two exceptions mm-hmm. um Part of that is the fact that hop whales are going to create some natural murkiness. Right. 
uh, where would you kind of draw the line on too much um, too much adjunct that's going to give you it's going to give you some pillariness or somebody uh, while still being a West Coast IPA? So what would make that in the West Coast camp for you? Man, uh, that's was that a deep question? <laughs> <laughs> that, I was going to say that's a deep question. That, like, <laughs> it's 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 something that it, that I have thought about. Like where I don't know. Do I draw that line? I guess just yeah. in my own head or or where should where should yeah the whole industry draw that line like um i don't i don't know that i have a, a great like ready answer for that um because yeah i don't mind at all having some haziness in a, in a west coast ipa right. um but there does get a point where oh that's too much yeah that's a hazy ipa yeah <laughs> i think some part of the conversation needs to go towards the hops when i think of west coast ipa i think of generally speaking the aggression comes from you know that weed dankness or it comes from very very focused citrus qualities or it comes from pine qualities mm -hmm. yeah. so once the citrus turns into like this is like a guava citrus or like a you know you know one of those citrus adjacent fruits mm -hmm. then i feel like the hopping kind of goes away from west coast yeah uh, but you can still rely on the body in those cases to yeah. be neutral enough that it's still west coast to you i don't mm -hmm. know well and i think the what you're saying there is it's the difference between fruity and citrusy yeah because as soon as it gets into what i like classifies fruity guava mm -hmm. mango even pineapple in there like that that definitely is getting into the hazy juicy category for me yeah i think that if it was in that hazy juicy but still a bone dry body and maybe maybe there was some extra acid malt so it perceived still sharp i'd still have a tough time kind of figuring out whether it would be i don't even think juicy is a real style of ipa mm -hmm. but in the juicy yeah. feel slash hazy camp but a crystal clear beer or if you can still call it a west coast yeah uh jimmy asked about what about rice or corn um to, uh, to accentuate the sharpness of mm. uh, I, I used to use rice all the time in a lot of beers uh, i would say i use corn more often now because of the the fact that it adds some perceived aggression in my mind yeah. there's some like there's some this is a earthier not earthier but like uh uh i don't know savory your flavor if that makes okay. sense I th yeah yeah and i'm mm -hmm. going but to for the most part it's neutral so it's mm -hmm. easy sugar access and actually um just because west coast is a style i do think is a good kind of first homebrew ipa mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the other styles out there dustin asked what would you suggest for someone to brew at home as their first uh homebrewed ipa and not a hazy <laughs> I, yeah no um i i'm gonna recommend a west coast with no dry hopping yeah. Because yeah. of what Thomas mentioned earlier, that fear of oxidation, and especially <laughs> on the homebrew scale, it is so easy to oxidize your beer, and IPAs are so susceptible to that. Mm -hmm. um, River says Mosaic West Coast. I don't hate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get uh, a relatively new big fruity hop, and then you can brew it like a West Coast. Yep. And also keep your hops, like if you're your first homebrewed IPA, keep your hops simple. Yeah, like yeah, man. One I know. or two <laughs> hops is all you need. The first couple IPAs I was making years ago, it was like I had six or seven varieties, and it's like, oh, I like the little pine in that one, and I like the. Little. Yep. And yeah, I'm like, now if I can just do a single hop, I'm like, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, like this. That's is, how I build a lot of recipes. This is a single hop. hop. This is 100% citra. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and with two malts, it looks like. Uh yeah, it Pilsner was Pilsner and, and, and Spelt. Yep. Uh both lo uh both local. I used yeah. to build a lot of uh, our uh, hop or our IPA recipes here off of the same hop build that Pliny, like Pliny clones mm. use. And Pliny clones were like per edition, it's a blend of like four or five different hops. And so mm -hmm. when we were like weighing everything out, it'd be like four or five different <laughs> hops going to this edition. <laughs> and it was a pain in the butt. And now I realize that the only reason that the, you know, that kind of blend came from the top down is because big breweries aren't, they're not looking at the hops they're using. They're looking at the oils that they're using. Mm -hmm. And they're like, all right, if I want to make the same beer I made last year, I need to now blend these hops together because these yeah. are what I have access to. Yeah. And the, the oils are what's on their mind. It's not that the names don't even matter. Mm -hmm. And then Adam mm -hmm. mentioned high sulfates, uh, sulfate to chloride, uh, chloride for West Coast to punch up that dry perception and hop bitterness, which also helps into when you're, if you're doing water chem on the homebrew level, which yeah. I do think people should get into, but mm -hmm. I know it's not, it's a little scary as I didn't get into water chem until I started working in the professional world. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, Oh, water chem is stupid important. Yeah. <laughs> that was the same thing for me. I wasn't doing any of it, um, on the homebrew scale, but then now uh, went into professional brewing and then I had to, or commercial brewing, whatever. Okay. He does I, do water uh, chem. Uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was another of, thing very related to the malt bills on all this stuff. If you're looking to kind of bring forward, we call it sharpness, aggression, kind of cleaning that up, crisp finish, whatever, not a malt, but very relatable, adding a little bit of honey 
Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. As an adjunct, um, that honey is so bioavailable, it's going to really dry out whatever style you put it in. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on what honey varietal you put in there, it's going to bring a lot of flavor or it's going to bring zero flavor. Yeah. So there's a lot to do with that. I mean, there's just as many honey profiles and honey uh, varietals as there are malts to play with. <laughs> That's one of the main adjuncts that I actually wanted to talk in, uh, talk about uh, and just kind of make available to everyone for West Coast IPAs. I think it fits pretty well, mm -hmm. um, but I also can see it in like IPLs or like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Beer styles. Or are, even are, English IPAs a little bit. Yeah, depending on the style of honey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, just being able to create some subtle flavors that might end up in the final product, but also dry out the beer and, you know, don't add too much distraction. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know, do you want to dive into uh, maybe what range of flavors honey can create, um, what you expect to be left behind, and then, uh, you know, how people might be using that in their homebrews? Mm -hmm. um, so, there's so many, like, you know, nuances and details and stuff, but just kind of as a general overview, um, honey flavor is going to come out uh, very... Uh, relationally to the color so mm -hmm. the darker the honey the more rich and robust the flavor is going to be the lighter the honey typically the lighter and everything the flavor is going to be um, you, if you're going with the true varietal honey something like it's really kind of common is an orange blossom honey mm -hmm. now that's just going to perceive as almost nothing because the flavors are so delicate in the honey itself that with the malt the hops and everything it's just going to be overpowered and honestly you're getting a fairly expensive nice honey just to dry it out and, yeah. and that's okay but if you want to do something that's a little bit less expensive you can get something locally or whatever um napweed honey is really great um getting a little into the kind of the amber but um uh, alfalfa honey clover honey those are really accessible mm. uh in a lighter beer style they might leave just a little bit of a nuance um, yeah. and then if you start getting even darker buckwheat honey mint honey those are going to leave a really strong impression on your beer. I wouldn't use those in a in an IPA style. Yeah, um, those would be for like browns, ambers, whatever stuff like that. Maybe maybe a smaller amount, like an English IPA, like no, yeah, like, yeah. Um, I mean, buckwheat honey. You add a little bit of that, and it instantly tastes like an old ale. Like it just yeah. gets those leathery, oxidized almost flavors in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Uh, Adam Chumley, thank you so much for the super chat. This live stream is my spirit animal. Doing a honey lager in May. Doing about fifteen percent honey in Whirlpool, twelve percent honey malt and mash. Of the recipes, I've seen a total of thirty percent honey. Uh, honey slash malt seems average. Um, I don't use a ton of honey malt. I used to when I was uh, a younger brewer. Um, and then there was a couple beers that I ended up thinking it was too aggressive. So I stopped using honey mm -hmm. malt. Um, I but use you should send us some and then we'll taste it. And then <laughs> yep. we'll uh, believe in you. I was going to say, I use honey malt in the cookie whenever I do my cookie beers mm. um, oh. to add that a little bit. And I might actually add a little bit of like that darker honeys that you were yeah. mentioning. Uh, but or, or try to find mint and honey because mint's one of my favorite flavors. <laughs> yeah, and Washington State's one of the highest producers of meat or <laughs> mint <laughs> in the entire world. So I didn't know that mint honey is actually fairly accessible around here. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so Thomas has actually brought in. Uh, is he he's he a hunter honey farmer or does he just work with farmers? To, oh, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. He he is an apiary or apiarist. Okay. A beekeeper in the area. Uh, uh, and he's and so he's brought is that that's the one that's brought in all the samples and stuff like that, right? Yeah, he's brought in some samples. Yeah, yeah. But he's brought in like a, like a box of thirty different honeys <laughs> that we've just kind of tasted, and that would blow your mind on how different different types of honey can mm -hmm. be. You know, all the way from color to thickness to flavor. Like yeah. the, everything that goes into it is crazy. Or the time that James brought in all the different honeys. Yeah, from James. Hawaii. We've brought in uh, yeah with James a bunch of Hawaii varietals. That mm -hmm. was that uh, that was a ton of fun to yeah. just taste those <laughs> and it was really interesting because it's varietals that i've never tasted because they're all tropical oh yeah all, uh, i mean in order to have local honey varietal you have to have that plant growing locally so. yeah um jimmy's got a question uh, i don't know too much about mint honey or what flavor comes through in the final product with mint honey mm -hmm. would it would it accentuate the mint qualities of hops like polaris or northern brewer um i haven't used mint honey in quite enough um by the time it's fully fermented, it's maybe going to bring some accent, in my opinion. I don't think it's going to be super dominant on that mint. Yeah. A lot of times when it's on, like when the bees are foraging off of this particular um, flower or whatever, it some of that translates into the final product, mm. but not all of it. So it does bring a little bit of mint. Also, terroir is going to 
really play a big factor how wet the plants were how much water the bees had access to that may or may not bring up that level of mintiness interesting um but i love that idea of pairing it with polaris or northern brewer i think that would be really good yeah uh, and that's uh, there's a ton to think about so would you say with honey in general it's kind of one of those things that you've kind of with anything varietal specific have to give it a taste and kind of feel out how it's going to play on the beer yeah i would say first thing is just say your consistency is to be consistently good rather than mm -hmm. consistently the same every single time. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, we can take that approach with hops and we're looking at oil content so we can really mimic every aspect of that the same way. You're just kind of not gonna get that from year to year or even hive to hive the same year uh, with honey. So yeah, what I would recommend is there's going to be some really good guidelines with mint honey is pretty much always within this. Uh, orange blossom honey always kind of over on this area. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, anytime you get something, I'd take a little spoonful, um, have some just on its own, maybe dilute some in water, see how it tastes diluted. Mm. If you really want to get into it, um, uh, and, and then kind of go that way, but because there's a lot of terroir that plays into honey profiles. Uh, one last, by the way, Yeast in the Beast is making a Honey West Coast IPA next weekend. That sounds delicious, send us some. Um, but one last kind of question specific in the honey world that's just in my mind, I haven't seen anybody ask it yet, but would you see a role or a purpose for using honey specifically as a back sweetener uh, in beer? Yeah, um, um, you're gonna need to somehow halt fermentation, obviously, um, because it will eat up every bit of that honey. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a great back sweetener. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking like if you were trying to do a, uh, you know, use some sort of enzymes or brooded your beer mm -hmm. on accident, or maybe you got a Brett infection and it fermented mm -hmm. too low, uh, and then you could still kill off the yeast and add some honey to kind of yeah. f fill it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a great way. Um, and finished fermented honey is extremely thin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it's mostly sugar and then all that sugar is removed. Um, but yeah, it will add some body if you use it as a back sweetener and it's not fermented. Yeah. So there will be a little bit of body, a really nice clean sweetness. Um, yeah, it works really well. Awesome. I'm going to ask the question that there's probably on some people's minds. What about an, a Braggot IPA? Do you yeah. think that could actually be something that exists? <laughs> I think that works very well. I did make some of those over at uh, bellwether mm -hmm. don't know again if they're doing those now but yeah it had uh, a couple of different uh, braggot ipas and i was using i think on one of them i used uh, orange blossom honey that was from florida i think um, and then i wanted to use some more local stuff so i was doing um, raspberry honey blackberry honey some of those um, and yeah it was really it was really cool seeing how some of those different honey varietals like the blackberry honey um, added a little bit more body to it, almost accentuated the maltiness rather than accentuating the hoppiness. Yeah. So yeah, just those different kinds of honeys, man. They'll, um, they, they all play different a, roles. A wine opener. Oh yeah, I did not bring one. I was gonna say, I, yeah. have, I have some around here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna say that's, um, uh, that's again, if we're talking about IPAs and what, what to make the IPAs unique, mm -hmm. do a braggot IPA like. I think somebody here was asking about percentages on some things too. Uh, Adam, Adam in his super chat mentioned was... about 30% honey versus malt uh, seems oh, okay. average. Yeah, there's a huge, I don't know, discrepancy, matter of opinion, conversation, <laughs> whatever. How much honey does it take from simply a honeyed beer yeah. to a braggot? <laughs> One thing to understand is that Braggot is historically, culturally, everything, a style of mead that uses grain rather than a beer that uses honey. Um, there are a lot of competitions out there that say there has to be at least 20% honey for it to be considered a Braggot. I personally find that very low. That seems I say, low to me. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's why there's a lot of subjectivity. Um, to defining these styles. Like we were even talking earlier, like where does it go from a West Coast IPA to a hazy IPA? Like, yeah, I was gonna brewer's say, preference. Like, <laughs> I, to me, it's at least thirty-five to forty percent is kind of where the on the honey on yeah for the bare minimum. On a yeah, bracket. for me, it's a third. So about thirty, thirty-three percent. If I can do a minimum uh, of that, then I'm comfortable calling that a braggot. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say is I made my first braggot ever for bra uh, Bell, oh, cool. Bell yeah. Weathers braggot, which turned out. Okay. Yeah. It was not what I wanted, but <laughs> well, partially because I got it from the six, seven percent up to like eight point oh, seven yeah, yeah, percent. Yeah. It's it's easy. A little honey goes a long way. Um, my my personal thing uh, when I'm making a braggot, I usually toe that line of about fifty fifty. 
Okay, yeah. Fifty percent honey to fifty percent malt. That's just my personal. Yeah, guideline. and I know in my understanding, Washington laws technically have to be just under on the. Washington, as a state, doesn't seem to care so much, okay. but it's the TTB yeah. governing those um, ratios. And what most of the LCB officers will tell you is basically that they have to follow the TTB. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's ex exactly. Okay, cool. Um, that, that helps. I feel like you had to dump a beer because of that actually at one point in time, or like almost had to dump a beer. They told me to. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> had to dump? <laughs> had to dump a beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, th there was a there was a um, a small argument. No, I I was told to dump some <laughs> beer because it had too much. Ah, oh, shucks! I thought that was gonna work. Yeah. Um, dang, I really should have brought a, a bottle opener. <laughs> I need I need a, or a, a a corker. I mean, I need a true drywall screw. Is what I need. Yeah. I was gonna say you don't have one randomly in the homebrew supplies. I, ha I have well, not a not a decorker. I have uh, plenty of things that make corks go into bottles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so we we've talked about ragged. Um, let's since we've we've kind of danced danced around it. Let's what do you, what are your thoughts on making juicy or hazy IPAs? Which I'm gonna be honest, I'm tired of <laughs> <laughs> see Unique. it's funny on one hand they're so ubiquitous they're just everywhere but also they're pretty good i mean yeah no I, no 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 if it's you if, can't mess them up and there's some examples that are not very good but i mean as a yeah. style if it's well executed it's really good there's a reason that it's so popular yeah and again as as we were mentioning earlier on the homebrew side they are probably one of the hardest styles mm -hmm. to nail because of the oxidation risks yeah yeah um and uh, one of the ways to avoid it is again not doing any dry hop and stuff and just do as you're uh, on flame out and as you're dropping temperatures just do different hop additions mm -hmm. um but i what, what are some ways to make that unique other than the obvious adjunct flavors of different fruits and stuff uh, to help so like i would say when you're adding the hops at different temperatures um obviously while you're boiling the longer you boil you're getting more of the bitterness the, the, the less heat you subject to it for a shorter amount of time, the more aroma flavor you're getting out of it. Um, one thing I really like to do is at the end of boil, uh, kill the heat, mm -hmm. circulate it for a while till I get down to about 190. Yeah. And then uh, and then I throw in my final whirlpool and doing a whirlpool is awesome. Yeah. You know? um, and then um, and then throwing in my final hops that way and letting it sit for about a half hour or so. Um, trying to keep it at about 190 to 180 mm -hmm. in that range to me. That's kind of, I know that exact temperature fluctuates depending on who you're talking to, but yeah. that's about where I like it. I feel like that brings out a lot of that softer, juicier profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I'm secretly stressing everyone out. Of I know. <laughs> this. I, uh, there's a reason I'm now turned away from you. <laughs> um, is there a pocket knife? I find sometimes if you get a pocket knife and twist that and kind of pull it out. Uh, yeah, but. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have one. I don't know if you guys have a pocket knife. No. I'm hoping maybe the the horizontalness of this will do it. Yeah. I'm trying to be as careful as I can so I don't get cork in the, in the actual. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but meat itself. at this point in time, I think the majority of the way to make hazies unique is just accentuating different flavor profiles within mm -hmm. the hazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, one of your expertises that I think would feed really well into this conversation is be, being able to use certain botanicals or being able to use yeah. the actual flowering some things to give you more direct flavors mm -hmm. rather than trying to find those flavors in hops because sometimes a lot of the... <laughs> that's fair. D D um, Daniel just, had the best song. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share this bottle afterwards, though. So. <laughs> and I do like Jimmy's if bottle of wine bottle openers only fit on keychains. Yeah. Oh, no, they do. It just depends on... <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on now. Let's see if I can get this without Let's pulling. See, the whole world nope. is watching. Lighter Dead to oh, yeah. the that's cork. Was... Yeah. There, there's another suggestion. Um, well, if I already poked a hole through the lighter to the cork, isn't going to work, though. If I poked a hole through, like, if the hole oh, because it, yeah, it'll break the. It's no longer uh, airtight. Yeah. Uh, this is when that works. Okay. Yep. Um, um, yeah. So some botanicals, if we wanted to kind of accent, um, an easy one to kind of go to is maybe you're looking for something, but you want some more pine in it. I guess hazies aren't really known for pine profile, but let's just go with pine profile for a moment. Well, I was gonna say, uh, you know, uh, like or. Um, spruce can you can get some fruity yeah. flavors out like yeah spruce so the whole pine family is edible and i need and everybody always just check your whole i'm not taking responsibility for that but <laughs> do, do your research on, on if you're going to go and uh forage or anything like that um but uh, uh the whole pine family and that includes fir spruce 
tamarack, and pine. Um, uh, oh, you did say fir, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, my favorite out of that whole group is fir. I just, it's it's so good. Um, it brings in like key lime flavors almost. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> if you're wanting to just add a little bit of like really accentuate, oh, I want some pininess to come through. I know Chinook is good for that. And you just really pound the Chinook, but that year's Chinook is actually more grapefruity and I'm yeah. not getting as much pine as I want. Dang, which, okay, okay, well, just add some juniper berries and then that's not pine uh <laughs> so i was talking about pine but i mean you can add in just a little bit of um juniper berries maybe a little bit of resin from uh fir or pine or something uh maybe just some tips from mm. the spruce tree a lot of people think it's got to be uh the fresh tips that are in like may or june i use all year long and in fact in some ways i actually prefer the um the uh, aged, the aged, aged, the mature aged. growth. Yeah. Um, especially if it's just a little accent, because yes, you're going to get a little more tannins. You're going to get a little more, uh, res Ooh, is it kind of coming? I was, oh, sort of. of. was going to see if I did poke through, but I was also going to be making sure I didn't have any corks that are pushing in. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And yeast in the BC did say hop stand, uh, 180 to 190 for 30 minutes. Yeah. Right, hazy. Yeah. Um, uh, and then that's that same kind of thing. Um, Another very obvious one, if you're wanting to push a little more uh, citrus. Okay, well, I've got some citra and cascade, whatever. I really want to push forward uh, some more grapefruit. I'll just put in some grapefruit zest into, mm -hmm. and, and I would say cold side, do it, do more of like a, a cold extraction, alcohol extraction if you're doing zest. Too much chance of it getting bitter if you throw it in hot side, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, then you can get into just some totally other stuff. Um, like. And, and it's still kind of, you know, common enough, but maybe some culinary stuff. Sage and rosemary are really awesome alongside hops. Yeah. They're going to bring in a little of that uh, almost weedy sort of dank mm -hmm. pininess to it. Um, they will. And, and a little bit goes a long way. Like even in a 10 barrel batch, I might only put in an ounce or two. Yeah. Uh, and you're still going to get that kind of subtle um, uh, nuances that really play well against those other hops and, and whatever else you're putting in there. Yeah, I think it's just a, it's such a great and so obvious of an answer once you think about it. But it's one of those things that for whatever reason, adding anything into, especially IPAs, it's not hops, is mm -hmm. for whatever reason, been like a taboo subject. Yeah. Unless you like completely change the flavor and you're like a blood orange IPA, which has been done a million times. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And there's some that it's like been done enough times that it doesn't feel weird anymore. Mm -hmm. One of the very, one, one thing that I do a, a lot in just kind of any aspect of my life is trying to bring the historical to the modern and smash it together without violating both, but I probably end up violating both. Yeah, I mean, but in, in a good way. Like, they, yeah. they kind of liked it, you know? Uh, so one thing that I'm going to be doing a little more intentionally uh, with Emrys is I'm just going to straight up call it a Groot IPA. Mm. So if you're not familiar with Groot, it's a um, pre-Reinheitsgebot beer style that did not use much hops. There was maybe some in there in the mix, but it was using any manner of uh, spices and herbs, whether it was farmed, culinary, um, foraged from the forest, whatever they could get. Um, and it, and it, it would literally was, if it was edible, it could go in beer. <laughs> um, but then just trying to kind of uh, bring both of those together. Mm -hmm. So that style, the Groot, Groot ales, Groot beers, um, blended with that, the modern, whether it's a uh, hazy or a West Coast or whatever and then putting those different botanicals together in with a, a nice malt and hops bill. And you get this really different experience that's very similar. Cause it's like, oh, it's kind of bitter. It's kind of fruity. It's kind of this and that like an IPA, but I've also got just this other depth of, of flavor. And, and of course you, like we were saying earlier, you, you know, seven or eight different hops varietals. You don't need to get crazy with botanicals either. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes you can say, well, I just want a speck of this and a speck of that. And it can get really, detailed and complicated but you really don't need to you want to push some pine just throw in some pine resin you want to push some citrus just throw in a little bit of, you know citrus peel or something yeah. like that. or, or yeah. lemongrass or lemongrass is another really great one yeah yeah absolutely um yeah i was gonna say yeah and i'm glad that you're putting hops in because I yeah <laughs> like i still remember that hop list <laughs> 
for those of you who know, I was pouring beer for a different brewery, and Thomas comes up, he's like, hey, try this real quick. Doesn't tell me what it is until after I try it, and the whole time I'm trying to clean my tongue with my teeth <laughs> while I'm pouring someone else's beer, and I'm like, this is, and I just keep, when everyone's like, is the beer bad? It's like, someone's beer is not great, as I kept pointing towards Thomas and Cameron giggling in the bed behind me. Well, because it, it was my first attempt at a hop-free <laughs> you know, pseudo IPA. Right. And um, I just, I really overbittered it. Um, and I ended up just naming that beer. I didn't put it on tap or anything like yeah. that. I just kind of had some people try it. I ended up calling it truth because the truth can be bitter. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say this it was, was a, so bitter. It was a fun experiment <laughs> and stuff, which is why I'm, why me and Peter for our, our the homebrew audience is someone, someone says, well, have you thought about doing this? We're like, or I'm thinking about doing this. We just say, do it. Yeah. <laughs> because the trying things, I think one of the ways, one of the ways to become, you know, learned. one of the more learned, learned people around is just not being afraid to try Which things. Which is why, like, you Seems are taboo. one of the experts on, like, adding botanicals <laughs> in, in, like, gruits in this area. I mean, yeah, don't be afraid to mess something up. Uh, granted, it's always sucks to just choke down a bottle of something you didn't really like. I mean, I, I don't like doing that. I'd rather dump it. Yeah. I was but it dump. sucks to dump, too. So, I mean, I well. get it, but also... That means your next one's just take notes. And that's yeah. that's what I always say on anything, whether I'm any hobby, any profession, any, you know, take your notes. That way, next time you can make your tweaks. And I'm going to text Hayden going. to bring a bottle up, bottle up <laughs> in there since he's going to be coming soon. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's like on the homebrew scale, you're on the high end and stuff, you're dumping maybe $40 mm -hmm. and stuff of where... Um, where and it's like in the long scheme of things that's really not that much money to as an experiment <laughs> yeah if it can be a learning opportunity i know that sounds so cliche but yeah. you know if we can have a learning opportunity i'm all for it and Ryan that was just up. like that that crazy right, so stupid bitter going. beer i'd use I forget if it was worm. I think it was wormwood that I had used. When you're doing yours at Emirates, are you going to stick a lot to the kind of classical, more traditional herbs? Are you going to do? You, do you have any ideas of like what you, can, what you might branch out and try that's not typical? I'm wanting to do a bit of both. I'm really focusing on that historical angle. So, and and we've I've got to go through TTB to make sure some of these are going to be you know all that. So yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, more historical stuff like mugwort. Um, birch bark you know some it seems fairly obscure right now but also doing pretty straightforward culinary stuff like sage and rosemary and lavender and whatever mm -hmm. um and then stuff that we can just find out in the forest uh the pine tips um uh rose hips are one of my favorites to go and forage oh, yeah um, those are really nice uh elderberries elder flowers depending on the the time of year I was going to say, in a lighter, in the session IPA, I can see a ro ro the rose tips being yeah. very nice in yeah. a, like a session or even any of the, anything floral in a session IPA would be really nice. Yeah, rose hips are awesome. They add a little acidity. They add kind of a citrusy note almost. Um, there's a fair amount of citric acid in it. Yeah. Just there, yeah. Uh, oh, Jimmy nice. says, I want to try a lavender milk stout. Yeah, and Dustin's yeah. saying he wants to try his own anti ran Heights uh, series, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Uh, Brew, Brew Dogs did that one, one time, an anti ran Heights Ryan Heights Cabot beer, where they juiced a bunch of cucumbers and used that for their mash oh, water. Oh, wow. That oh, was, that was their straight up mash water? Yeah, so just they're like, we're not even going to use water. Wow. Yeah, no, no. They, uh, yeah, I was going to say, me and you have talked about try attempting that at some point in time as well. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be pretty fun. Um, while, we're, so I, while we're talking about botanical editions, I think the one IPA kind of category that naturally leans into botanical editions is the white. IPA. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, uh, um, I don't know, any evolution uh, to the white IPA style coming when you're playing around with, bot when, with botanicals? My thing with kind of white IPA or really anything that we might call Belgian IPA or anything with the Those yeast are actually two phenol? different styles. Technically now. Technically. <laughs> what, oh, are, are they calling wit something different? The white IPA is yeah. not built off of a wit beer? A wit, yeah, now, yeah. yeah, now they are. Yeah. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's nomenclature. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, on, on, on my end, I don't like the way the, the yeast phenols and everything go with hops. Mm -hmm. On a personal scale, I kind of think if we're going to do something that's like that, whether it's me personally or even just on an uh, industry scale to, to, to have that style grow, we need to get away from phenolic yeasts. Yeah. That's my opinion. Um, trying to bring out those... Um, 
uh, that wit style or just the, the, the Belgian IPAs and stuff. That's my take. However, on the botanical end, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for that. Um, uh, if it's just kind of straightforward, like using coriander and yeah. stuff, that's a very great one. But then there's also other stuff that would be very similar. You mentioned lemongrass. That'd be easy go to. Other flowers, chamomile would be really great. Yeah, um, peppercorns. Yeah, be. peppercorn. Try to get the um, pseudo phenol flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite is uh, grains of paradise. Very similar to black pepper, okay. but it doesn't build on the palate. Yeah, and it does bring a little bit of kind of uh, candied lemon flavor to it a little bit. Yeah, what beard style beer styles would go well if you only used tea for water? Uh, kind of depends on the tea, uh, I guess. I was going to mm-hmm. say, as someone who very light tea has very much looked into brewing beers with tea after I did my coffee and beer series. Um, I think it, I think a yeah. tea white IPA actually kind of fits. Yeah. That, a tea white IPA. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going uh, more aggressive tea, like some of the burnt teas, I think that goes into a lot of English styles. I've done uh, some tea brown ales. Yeah. yeah. Really nice. Yeah. Cause you got enough body to kind of build on with a little mm-hmm. of the extra I, stuff. I was going to mm-hmm. say tea cream ales. Again, I just because I I think that if you're experimenting with adjuncts, cream ale is just a nice light enough body that, with enough to back it up to help push whatever adjunct you're going mm-hmm. with forward. More importantly, there's probably some sort of really good name innuendo you can play around with tea bagging and cream. <laughs> <laughs> oh I mean, yeah, there are some opportunities. Uh, Best comment wins in the on the on the internet. I, I yeah. Uh, and we are going to do a Boston tea beer for our state beers. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Tea uh, is one of those things. If you, if, if you do a cold extraction and stuff, it's going to be a lot softer, mm-hmm. a lot, um, uh, you, you know, you'll just get the, the flavor and the aroma out of it. If you were to subject it to a lot of heat or a really long time or just straight up boil it, you'll get a lot more tannins out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes that's desirable, um, especially when I'm making mead. If I'm using tea, I'll actually use tea intentionally for tannins. Yeah. A lot of times brewers try to stay away from tannins. I'm not as afraid of them as maybe most brewers well, are. And yeah. So if you can cover them up with some thickness or. Yeah, there's some there's some ways that you can still kind of play with that or you can reduce your hop load so that the hops bitterness plays well with the tannins. You know, there's some stuff that you can do. Like that. Um, and uh, I was going to say, to, and actually, uh, if you're, we're going down the tanner route, IPA, like a bunch of different IPAs, because I actually think tannins can live in IPAs personally. Mm-hmm. At the right level and, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to overdo it. You can't just ignore it and let it get yeah. out of hand. But yeah. yeah. I think fresh oaked IPAs were a popular thing for a little while. I've there was people a, that did that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I think Mike did a couple of them. I don't know. Mike did a lot of tree beers, and so I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he ran some IPAs through some trees at some point in time. Yeah. And Steve, I will, if you do a baked bean uh, beer instead of a tea beer, we will accept that for when we get to Massachusetts. <laughs> well, uh, Yeast and the Beast is already saying what kind of uh, beer would best be made with just hot dog water. Uh, our <laughs> Illinois Chicago beer. There we go. <laughs> uh, Chicago dog inspired. Um, Daniel Chamomile Cream Ale. I like that idea. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw an English breakfast uh, Amber Ale. Amber Ale. Um, Adam said honey pills could work well with a light tea infusion. I like that idea. Yeah, because mm-hmm. dragon fruit and tea, tea bag and dragon. I'm in, I'm into it. Um, well, a- actually, we're going to Connor ask tips on a sour IPA. Let's talk about that a little bit because sour IPAs are actually something that I've done a decent amount, and I think that that could be. I don't think it's technically a style yet, even though they've nope. like there's like a million IPA styles. But that's one thing that I would like to see more often. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people steer away from it for the same reason they steer away from tannins in IPAs. Mm-hmm. They think that the hop bitterness and the hop extraness is going to um, amplify the sourness and or the tannin, and that's why it's going to get uh, over kill. But uh, last time I did a sour IPA, actually I've, kind of, I've done it both ways. I've done a dry sour IPA, and that one's a lot harder to pull off. Mm. But I've also done sour fruited milkshake IPAs where mm. you've got so much sweetness and so much other fruit going on um, that there's a good base for both the sour and the hops to live yeah. on top of. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, it's, um, sour IPAs is one of the few times I actually prefer it as a kettle sour. Typically, mm-hmm. I'm not. I, I think kettle sours tend to be a little one-dimensional. It's just personal mm-hmm. thing. But um, in sour IPAs, I kind of prefer them that way. <laughs> yeah, because you only got the one thing to play with. You yeah. don't have to worry about all the other whatever <laughs> yeah. craziness could happen. Yeah, and I was gonna say. Um, so 
the big tip is do a kettle sour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on top of the fact that if you have a lot of hops, there's not a lot of souring bacteria that can still live right. on top of all the hop hop yeah. you know stuff. But just in terms of a flavor, you don't want to um, you don't want you know especially blended sours or American wild ale stuff adding on to it. Although there is a space I think for yeah. heavily dry hopped American wild ales, but mm-hmm. that's a technically a way different category. <laughs> and um, and honestly, if you're doing going the like sour route, play around with that that hazy. Mm-hmm. Make, the, it, the make it big and fluffy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because add lactose, add a lot of oats, add all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, because that that hazy already, as we talked, has that those fruity characteristics, and mm-hmm. a lot of people, especially if kettle sours, consider kettle sours to be that more kind of slight pucker fruitiness. Um, it's kind of going along the what all you can build into both sour IPAs, but also hazies in general. And this kind of also takes us back to the topic a little bit where we're talking about things that might end up being a trend or might help you amplify your IPAs this next year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, it was last year or maybe two years ago that I think oat milk was kind of going around as a common oh, adjunct. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you played around with that at all? I haven't used anything like that. I mean, yeah, when it's been oats, it's just been oats. I just the oats. Yeah. Yeah, I know that uh, Ryan, hello be Ryan, that's now down in uh, Colorado, Colorado yeah. was doing, uh, he did an oat milk uh, IPA series, and they were all, they were all great. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know that I've even tried an oat milk beer at all. So I've heard of it. Yeah. I just haven't, I don't know that I've had one. I have one in the, ferment. Yeah, it might have been kegged, actually. I've got one either in the fermenter that's currently kegged. It's probably currently kegged because I know what two beers are in the fermenters. Um, that uh, is not on tap, but it was an oat milk coffee stout. Oh, cool. Ooh, um, and I did good. feel like I got an, an interesting layer from the maybe the extra proteins or something that was in the oat, oat milk but i didn't do anything spectacular to it. i did actually mash the oats which is probably not the way to get the haziness if you're doing like an oat milk hazy you usually want to do that fermentation or like later fermentation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um but by mashing it i kind of figured felt like i might get some of the protein breakdown and didn't know what it was going to add but uh, i do feel like i've got a little bit of uh i don't know maybe almost savory complexity mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know if that has a place in maybe an english ipa but <laughs> yeah uh that idea of a puer porter. I mean, there's some play on words there too, but yeah, that would yeah. be really good. That uh, would be a really good tea uh, to use in beer. Well, nice. and I'm, I'm going to, because I saw this on the video that w- will probably get removed <laughs> later, but uh, Daniel's <coughs> mentioned um, for just, again, trends and stuff, I actually see uh, black IPAs or CDAs coming back into kind of mm. The light, not necessarily the forefront, but the light. I think that there's going to be a lot more breweries that are playing around with that roasty. Mm-hmm. I think there's a way to do it now that we've kind of gotten into the world of making softer flavors come out of IPAs and not yeah. having to be super aggressive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also with making session IPAs, I think there's a lot of ways to maybe make a black IPA that isn't what it used to be, which is an 8%, you know, yeah. just flavor bomb. It always just had to be this, yeah, it was almost like, oh, it's a black IPA, it must be an Imperial or, you mm-hmm. know, some big monster. and. Just I really like that style if it's hit right. I mean, uh, you know, I feel like you should use debittered grains. You don't want a lot of the acridity from the, um, you know, I would say you don't want a porter or stout level yeah. Yeah. roastiness trying to compete with the IPA level bitterness, personally. Um, uh, but it is one of my favorite IPA styles, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I was going to say, I know that... I think there's um, a lot of play with it. Yeah. For the Lesser Cup, Whistlepunk has one on right now. And oh, cool. It smells absolutely amazing. Nice. I haven't, I haven't been through the current uh, Lester Cup. I need to. Whenever I try a decent amount of, like, a, com- a good commercial black IPA, it always seems to be, a, like, a hit. Like, for whatever reason, I can always do... Like, sometimes I don't want an IPA. Sometimes I don't mm-hmm. want one or whatever style. Yeah. I seem to always fall into black IPAs and want them. It's just too bad that they always kind of lean into that, like, hey, I'm going to be big... Uh, you know, usually on a little bit on the sweeter side, and then mm-hmm. add all the hops and some. Roast it's almost like sometimes there. I feel like they try to be a, a really hoppy imperial stout yeah. rather yeah. than a true blend of styles, if you will. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I absolutely agree. And my buddy, who is a hardcore IPA drinker and stuff, he had the black IPA, and he's like, "This is really, really good." Mm. Uh, Jesse Zomak's got an interesting question. Costco has oat powder now, mm. um, which. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what being there, but uses a back sweetener for a 10 yeah. minute boil addition. That'd be, uh, I don't know exactly what oat powder would do, but I'm guessing it's going to have, uh, you know, a similar amount of proteins as like what you would get off of, you know, any other like flour mm-hmm. powders. Partly I would check the ingredients list. Just make sure it's all, you know, it's just <laughs> oats. Um, mm-hmm. there's probably going to be some anti-caking agents or whatever, but if you know, it's only oats, then you can 
probably contrive enough information for well oats is this way i don't know i, I haven't seen that but that would be my first thing is check the ingredients mm -hmm. yeah as a back sweetener i think that'd be interesting at yeah. work but i don't know what to would you i would just try to blend it in hot water and see if it dissolves correctly or if it uh you know cakes or clumps or it does weird things yeah is it supposed to be something that dissolves or is it a suspension yeah if it's if it's flour it's not going to work as a back right. sweetener but yeah. yeah so i guess i don't I have i don't know about buy some bring it here we'll try it out <laughs> Or, or just bring us a beer with it, you make with it. Yeah, I was going to say, Jesse, you're, you're local. Make the beer and bring it. <laughs> no. Um, I'm going to jump real quickly to uh, uh, Dustin. What uh, what grains would you use to that was you. get dark uh, character without Excuse the me. bitterness for black IPAs? <laughs> uh, my favorites, there's, there's several options out there. My favorite is Midnight Wheat and Black Prince. Yeah. I was going to say those were like midnight. We was like the number one I was thinking yeah. of. <laughs> um, yeah, those are my two favorites. Uh, Jordan asked using black rice in a black IPA, maybe. I don't, know. I don't think black rice is going to impart the color, the color and everything you're after. It might help with just uh, that might give some interesting flavor. I mean, it'll act like rice more than it'll act like a, a, a coloring agent. Adam, midnight wheat all day and twice on Sundays. Yeah. <laughs> I do people really like. People always have that question about like a purple rice or you know red rice or all those different colors. Ooh, yeah, that smells delicious. That yeah, delicious. You, a lot of those colored um, grains. I mean, even like purple Egyptian barley and stuff. The hull that's typically named after just what the hull color is, but that's not going to translate into your product. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very. Which uh, I guess we can't talk about the new Valley Cup yet. Oh, never mind. <laughs> that uh, somewhat relates to the Valley Cup challenge that's coming up, but I can't tell you what it is. I don't think. Uh, and then uh, yeast. Uh, this is just a good IPA question. Um, yeast and the beast thoughts on traditional bittering hops as late edition boil or hop stand editions. Most of them are fun. They do different things than you'd think. They, if you're thinking they're going to have just a crazy weird big flavor that you haven't heard of before, usually it's not the case. But they do give more traditional. You can use more of them a lot of times, and they give more traditional grassiness with a hint of flavor which isn't a bad side of a beer it's just a side of a beer we haven't you know strived for in a long time since mm -hmm. we have crazy crazy hop scientists now <laughs> and then um i'm just going to point out when you are testing out new hops and stuff one of my favorite <clears throat> ways to do it is do a smash just figure out what the hop is going to taste like mm -hmm. and just find your because we all have our one preferred base malt. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we kind of play around and stuff and can change. But let's be honest, every brewer has. Yeah. Halcyon their, is the best. So Halcyon, yeah. uh, Maris Otter, mm -hmm. Genie Pills, probably for Grangehead. I see a lot of their beers. Yeah, like Genie. yeah, we use a lot of Genie over there. Um, but it's like, use and just do a simple smash beer. Mm -hmm. And honestly, yeah. <laughs> With gonna, the, getting good at smash beers is just going to improve your brewing overall anyway yeah you there's very the little to hide behind right. yeah yeah it's gonna i love smash beers but and it teaches <laughs> you how to make sure that your can your processes are consistent the way that they're supposed to be yeah. and you're not trying to create a big flavor you're trying to re create a really really good beer and being able to craft good beer is the for a lot of people it's like the 12th step to becoming yeah. a brewer but it should be the first step to <laughs> yeah. becoming a brewer <laughs> yeah I, yeah I was gonna say I, we all fell into that probably when we started oh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, let, let's oh, just man. be like You've seen my brewing, and you oh. know my technique was never the best. And then I started working in the professional world. I was like, well, I need to improve my technique. <laughs> I think my third beer was like an orange chocolate porter, and you know, I, it, 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 there's always some big crazy flavor. Yeah, my well, the first, and and I had brought it into you, but the first original recipe I did was this Braggett Kaiser. It was honey malt apple cider mm. and there was hops and there was ginger and lemon thyme it was just like this yeah. <laughs> just a mess this of flavors. big old thing <laughs> but yeah um and then i'm going to call out real quickly jimmy has uh done a played around with uh a bunch of different rices with his rice lager stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've tasted some of his rice beers. They're they're really he's, cool. He's really he's. I would say Jimmy currently in the Spokane area is kind of the expert on using rice. He's the riciest. <laughs> um, he's the riciest guy I know. <laughs> there. Um, Be careful how that's so, announced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, and then Daniel uh, breaks down his thoughts on the, uh, for uh, black IPAs, the black prints for kind of that neutral mm -hmm. blackness. Midnight for some soft chocolate. chocolate and yeah. the Parafa Special 3 for that mocha. 
kind of espresso coffee. Mm -hmm. yeah, I use Carafa 2 or Carafa 3 a lot. Actually, one of, one of my tricks when I'm doing black IPAs is uh, is I use regular chocolate uh, or chocolate wheat. Chocolate wheat's kind of like a fruity mm -hmm. um, Ooh, yeah. flavor compared to like normal chocolate malt. Um, but I like, it's just cold steeping. Yeah. So, and then I'll just add the strained out water through the mash. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah someone here added it. that. Yeast and the Beast said the cold mashing the dark, which we did for the black IPA with the random hops. Yeah. Uh, I've also done it where I've idea. experimented with yeah. adding um, the dark grains at uh, Vorloff. Oh, okay, yeah. And just get them in. So it, there's still a little bit of heat, but it's only really exposed for however long your Vorloff takes. Didn't Do I remember correctly, you did at some point in time, you did a coffee beer where you added the grains in the coffee wolf? Mm -hmm. I've done coffee beers a few ways. Like we were talking earlier about, oh, instead of water, like I've brewed with coffee instead of water. Yeah. Um, oh, I've that sounds it, fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, messes with Warren's your pH because it's so acidic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Um, Just do a coffee I, sour. Yeah, and I've done it that way. But put put the grain, the the coffee grounds right in with the mash. Because it like should that. filter it out, you know, through, yeah. through, through, through the same vorlaving technique. Mm -hmm. huh. That's it. Uh, Jordan had a question. Any experiment experience with Phantasm? So Phantasm is probably something we should talk about while we're talking about new things that are going to be going on in the IPA world in 2023. Uh, Phantasm is a is a wine tannin based thiol precursor. Uh, so basically designed to work really well with um, yeast specifically that specialize in uh, thiolization um, biotransformation, which is you know kind of one of two things that yeasts can do for biotransformation. And uh, so uh, the long answer is I have not yet had enough experience to really give you a definitive answer. Um, I have hunches that it could be a great hop substitute if you don't want to stress, you know, the type of hopping that can, you know, lead your beer prone to oxidation. However, I also have a theory that the same wine tannins could be gathered maybe in, in a less expensive way. Um, but I don't, I haven't dig, dug enough into the science to know if, if Phantas Phantasm is actually just the same wine tannin mm -hmm. type stuff that we have access to already. Yeah, kind of like that. I need a little more experience and hands on. So far, I've been a little underwhelmed mm -hmm. by whether it's commercial examples or homebrew examples. I'm like, oh, it's good beer. I don't quite get the hype yet. Yeah. Not saying it's not a thing, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm a little on the fence about it still. I don't know. In my brain, I think the best way to experiment with it would be to make underhopped IPAs and try to mm -hmm. gain the fruitiness of an IPA by using that and yeah. the thialized yeast. Yeah, and it could be too, just I haven't quite hit that. I mean, uh, there's going to be a little bit of learning curve, I feel like, on something like that, trying to really yeah. dial in those precursors, understanding the difference between precursor and, the, you know, I mean, there's yeah. a lot to it. Knowing well, how I put the in some grape skins, it should be better, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> not, the, yeah, not the same. Yeah. yeah uh, you, and some yeast won't be able to use, use those correctly. Some mm -hmm. yeasts will, uh, uh, some yeast, you know, might even just be temperature dependent whether or not they really attack those. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and then I was going to say, that also is, I think, going to be a trend is just playing around with different yeasts. Also, having watched your yeast, one of your yeast videos, or our yeast videos that we just watched them all. We have uh, all the yeasts. But but using what the up, non uh, traditional like ev like there is advertised. These are IPA yeasts. Mm -hmm. Use the yeast that aren't advertised as IPA yeast to get the different flavor profiles. Yeah, out I, of them. I hardly ever use Chico for. I mean, if I'm going to use Chico, it's probably for like a wheat beer. If I'm being honest, right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Chico used to be the pale IPA strain yeah. that everyone used. And yeah. Oh yeah. I was yeah. So four is better. <laughs> I was going to say the coffee IPA I did Black Label. We use Darkness. Uh, Ricard Ricardi X. Um, Ricardo says, in my experience, less is more when it comes to thialized beer. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and mm -hmm. I also think that it'd be easy to cover up the effects of the, um, the thial, you know, thialized yeast, thialized precursors. It'd be easy to cover those up if you use too much hops. Mm -hmm. So I think, really, I think where it's going to shine, if it does, and again, both of us are saying we don't have the experience yet, hands on to know, mm -hmm. um, would be to use less hops. Yeah. Which could come with, we could could be nice because it could come with less risks. Like let's say you don't yeah. have to dry mm -hmm. hop, mm -hmm. one less spot to get oxygen. In your yeah, way. yeah, and it, and it could be that I just haven't maybe discovered it's awesome little niche and yeah. it could just be amazing and maybe i'll start using it i don't know yeah. <laughs> maybe the the italian grape ale versions of ipas will become the next thing with the, oh yeah the right Ooh. yeast yeah wow that, i could see i could see grapples being grapple ipas being <laughs> a thing um i also um just hit show sure. uh just in uh, general like we're speaking uh, speaking about wider 
I think session IPAs is going to be like one of the next big things to come up is yeah as, in, as in we general move. I think lower alcohol beers are kind of raising in popularity yeah yeah absolutely I, I see that for sure I've been gonna... studying the market just like the greater market a lot and yeah really trending to lower ABVs yeah which I have some fun ideas for later I'll share them with you later yeah nice <laughs> but I think that there's going to be some opportunities for us as people who are not typical brewers to well and capitalize you, on and that. Utah nice. is session or <laughs> any for se- <laughs> well, I was going to say session beer or se- or non-alcoholic beers when we get to Utah way down the road. Uh, Dustin and I have been a blast folks need to take the kiddo to the park later all. Uh, see you later Dustin. We're actually probably pretty close to starting to yep. close this thing out too. Um, Jordan Thurston with experimenting at my job at a commercial scale hopped the shit out of it along with Cosmic Punch um, and currently have one Phantasm fermenting. You'll have to send us some or at least let us know how it goes or how it's looking. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, while we uh, wrap up and stuff, uh, I'm going to call out. We have zero state beers, so if you've participated in this challenge at all, please send us state beers. I know Jimmy's bringing us his uh, Alaska one. Today. We've got, we've got my Alabama one. I know a couple people were planning on sending me some Alabama beers too, so get those in so we can do a tasting and hopefully have that up around the end of the month. That's the goal is to be able to do one at the end of every month, starting with the end of this month. So, And we may, with the lack of them, we may delay until February, but we'll, we're going to try to get on that. Um, and then upcoming, uh, let me pull up the list, is okay. next is Arizona. Which Arizona is a tree, be- no, pecan. No, uh, Arizona is churro or... I gotta start thinking about what I'm gonna make. Um, there was one other, uh, and I did add it. Um, churro lager or uh, her- uh, the drink. The horchata. Horchata. So if you end up making any of the state beers, by the way, and you can't send them to us or don't want to send us to send them to us, that's totally fine. Uh, but if you make something good or you're excited about some weird experiment you do, this kind of goes in general. Tag us on Instagram. Say, hey, I made this. What do you think? Show us your genus. Show us your genus. And then uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll share your thing on our page and, um, I don't know, talk about it. If you end up sending it to us, and it'll probably end up being on a video, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok or uh, YouTube. is probably is going to be on YouTube. But one of those things... Um, the beer representation of the state is a beer representative of the state. Yes. Yes. Um, Jordan, uh, it is in our discord. We're actually doing a whole thing. I will do my standard copy the link unless Jimmy beats me. And while he's doing that, go ahead and like this video. Um, and he's also going to, I think probably be able to share Thomas's Instagram one more time. Is that the best place to stalk you? Yeah. So I've gotten a little slower on the uh, the social medias, but yeah, I've got an Instagram and a Facebook page up. You can follow both. Once I get active again on mm. in that capacity, then that's where that's where I'll I'll, I'll launch it. So if we end not up doing, real active on it right now, if we end up doing more wheel of beers, we should do a foraged beer challenge with you versus someone else. Heck who can forage. yeah. Mm-hmm. That'd be really fun. I'm super into that. There's a hole on tap for that. By the way, <laughs> wheel of beer challenge is about to happen. We told you at the beginning, but in case you just tuned in. That guy is here, so um, will it be ring? Yeah, uh, so Jordan, um, and uh, a lot of these are inspirations. If you come up with a really cool, unique idea for a saying that represents the, the state, state in your heart, your heart, we'll accept um, it. Yeah, send it. You just got to send it with a good explanation. Yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, if you do send beers, uh, standard rule applies. Make sure that you say format or Matthew, um, so that way it gets put in the appropriate locations. Oh. As the whole staff here has been trained, those beers go into a very specific spot. <laughs> <laughs> or else they get drank by me, which isn't the, the end of the world. So, you know, yeah, it just, it live just your means, life, guys. Live your life. It just means it won't go on a video. Yeah. Uh, all right, we love you. Thank you so much. Like this video. Watch some other videos after this. Mm-hmm. Um, go find us on Instagram or TikTok. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna film a little beer. So f- follow us on Instagram if you want to see what ingredients end up being the special ingredients that are happening today. Nice. Yep. <laughs> My answer's right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Ending the last stream. Woot. Uh. I was gonna get to the at the beginning. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Which which we now know we can't have the anime plane. <laughs>